Welcome to Whiskey Cast. I'm Mark Gillespie, and this is another one of our special episodes to give you something else to do during the coronavirus pandemic besides watch the news. It's also a revival of sorts for our Whiskey Cast Tasting Panel podcast format, which has been on hiatus for a while. And just to bring it all together, this episode comes from our live webcast on April 15th, 2020. Two of our panelists may be familiar names to you. Alexander Rossi was the winner of the 2016 Indianapolis 500. And before he returned to the U.S. to compete in IndyCar, he spent several years in Europe on the ladder to Formula One and competed in five F1 races during 2015. You might also remember him from his 2018 appearance on the reality TV show The Amazing Race, where he teamed up with fellow IndyCar driver Connor Daly. James Hinchcliffe sat on the pole for the 2016 running of the 500, a year after coming within minutes of dying following a practice crash for the 500. During his career, he's won six IndyCar races, and he's also known for finishing second on Dancing with the Stars in the fall of 2016. Together, they're the hosts of the podcast series Off Track with Hinch and Rossi. They joined me from their homes in Indianapolis, along with the producer of Off Track, Tim Durham, to taste four different bourbons. You can watch the entire tasting on our YouTube channel, but for this podcast, we have edited out the opening and closing comments from the webcast so we can get down to talking with the guys and tasting some bourbons. We are going to talk for the next hour or so about whiskey, and we're actually going to be tasting bourbons this time around. If you're familiar with the Whiskey Cast Tasting Panel podcast, we're going to sort of bring that format back and do it on video for the first time. And I've got to tell you that this is a this is a show that I have been trying to do for a while. Now we have two guests so far. Third, a third one will be joining us. We have from. One of the podcasts I listen to regularly, Ask or it's Off Track with Hinch and Rossi. On your far right, James Hinchcliffe, the IndyCar driver. And in the middle, Tim Durham, known as Tim to his friends, the producer of Ask (laughs) Off Track. track. And we are waiting for Alexander Rossi to join us. And uh, there he is. Sorry, guys. Alexander. (laughs) Good to see you all. Good. If you guys want to bust on him for a couple of <laughs> late, feel free, guys. But uh, it's usually James. So this it wasn't is, uh, me. This is weird. It yeah. wasn't me this time. This I'm due crazy. for it. Yeah. As a listener of, of Off Track, you know that it's normally me that screws stuff up. So I'm uh, I'm thrilled, thrilled to bits today that it was out. Well, I mean, I, I I mean, to, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Alex. What'd you say? No, I just usually James delays this by like 25 minutes. This was like <laughs> 20 seconds. So. I'll take it. I'll take anyone yeah. I can get. Well, I have to admit, this is a podcast we've been wanting to do for a couple of years now, uh, because uh, I found out a couple of years ago that uh, you guys actually have a bit of a a bourbon love within the IndyCar paddock. We do. And you're, yes. I saw the, uh, the athletic piece that Bob Kravitz did with you a couple of weeks ago, Alexander, where he talked about taking you downtown in Indianapolis to taste bourbon and talked about this tasting club you guys have. Yep. First it, of all, it was funny because he, he was like, oh, oh, come out, come out for some bourbons. And I, I thought I ordered very modestly. And then he had a phone call with James afterwards and was like, oh, my God, it was $200. <laughs> what did you order? Um, Just some antique 107. And then I think we ordered, a, I think, like a Russell's store pick. Like, it wasn't anything crazy. I was trying to be respectful. But, like, you do – two pours each and it's 25, 30 bucks a pour. And and there you go. I have to admit, there is a reason why I generally don't buy whiskey when I go to bars. It's because uh, if you look back here, I got a reasonably decent selection at home. So that's awesome. Yeah. (laughs) Let's put it that way. So tell me how you guys do it in the first place and how they're, how widespread is this tasting club within the paddock? 
within the paddock it's pretty small um really it was uh, a mutual friend of of alex and i's uh it was actually sorry tim it was my my first producer for a podcast uh was you know a big bourbon guy worked in the indycar paddock and sort of introduced us to it and had a couple friends from around town that were sort of into it and i had actually gotten robbie wickens who was uh my teammate at the time into it and we decided, hey, why don't we get a little group together? And I think there's six of us total. Um, and what we try to do, and you know, obviously schedule pending, is get together once a month. We'll each bring a bottle in a bag, so it's a blind tasting. We'll set them all up, and we'll rate them blind, and then do a big reveal, and uh, you know, and see what what really is good bourbon, and and you know, what's what's maybe a label that you're buying more than actually the juice inside. And what have you guys found? I think the the most surprising thing that we found is is Woodford, like their best bourbon is just their standard Woodford Reserve. Like we've tried um, quite a few different iterations of it, some of their kind of um, limited edition stuff. And it's honestly, whenever we've done the blind tastings, it's been like towards the bottom pretty consistently. So it's interesting because Woodford and, and Basil Hayden's were the kind of two gateway bourbons, I think, for, for James and I. So um they're obviously both fine, but as, as our taste has evolved, it's very interesting to see how um, kind of the, the more standard labels fall by the wayside to a certain extent. Tim, how much experience have you had with bourbon? And do these guys share with you? I don't, uh, my, my palate is unrefined and battle worn. Uh, <laughs> I don't drink as nice of <laughs> bourbon as these guys, but I think I probably have a little bit more. What was that, Alex? I said it's just like your appearance, unrefined. <laughs> you know, it's vaguely March or April. I don't know. It's uh, <laughs> I haven't left the house in four weeks. <laughs> if you have not, in your defense, it's hard to keep track these Rocky days. And I it's March, bro. These guys bust on thim, as they call it, on a regular <laughs> basis. I'll show you an example of this. It's a sticker that the guys at Toronto Motorsports did a while back. With uh, <laughs> guys in, at the uh, yard of bricks at the speedway dumping a bottle of milk over, not them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's I don't a, think I've ever looked that's better. Pretty uh, accurate. It's kind of just a, an honor that he's on the sticker, to be honest. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but he makes yeah. you guys sound good. But the end, he's all said and done. I don't know. <laughs> If you have a question or a comment and you're watching right now, feel free to ask it in the uh, chat windows on Facebook, YouTube, or Periscope, and we can pass it along. We have some already. Uh, Martin McKenna, greetings from Ireland right now. Greg's Whiskey Guide, one of our regular listeners. Hi from Paris. Graham Fraser, hi from Scotland. Um, Bill Ricker in Boston, a smart bartender, told once told me Woodford Reserve is the Scotch drinker's bourbon. Okay. Hmm. Interesting. And uh, J.D. Hook uh, cracked the old elk. Looking forward to this tasting. And we have our first question, actually, before we get to the bourbons. Chris Ratcliffe has a question for you, Alex, because you've done some F1 in the past. How different are the paddocks in the U.S. versus Europe? Do the drivers hang out more? And I guess he's asking comparison between Europe and the U.S. I'm betting from what I've heard from you in the past, there's no comparison there. Oh, you're absolutely right. I mean, I think um, in Europe, it's... It's very much kind of every man for himself. Um, you know, it's all of the teams run their organizations like a, like a pretty cutthroat business. Um, the, 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 the money behind Formula One is, is a lot more than IndyCar. And um, to a certain extent, the phrase money is the root of all evil applies to that paddock pretty, pretty heavily. So there's just a lot of, of ulterior motives and hidden agendas. And it's difficult to know who kind of has your best interest at heart. Um, whereas you go IndyCar racing and, and while, you know, money is still, you know, the topic of, of most conversations, it's still more of a, a grassroots level type of, of professional racing. And, and people are there because they love competing and they love winning. Um, and people aren't doing it solely just to, to run a business and, and try and, and um, make as much money as possible, regardless of the outcomes. Like they're there to compete, they're there to win. And then the drivers, you know, because we race on the ovals, there's, a different level of, of appreciation and, and respect for one another. And that kind of trickles all the way from on the racetrack to off the track as well. So there's not many guys in the, in the European paddock that I would hang out with, whereas it's the complete opposite in IndyCar. 
Um, there's not many guys I wouldn't hang out with. So it was a welcome change, something that took me a little bit of time to get used to, but uh, ultimately I wouldn't have it any other way and uh, very happy to be here. Hinch, I have to ask you about this because you've been around the paddock a lot longer than Alex in IndyCar. Uh, the whiskey story that I can talk about with you on this one is that in 2010, when the first time I'd really had a chance to listen to you for any length of time, I'm sitting in a bed and breakfast on the island of Isla in Scotland during the Isla Festival on 500 race weekend on race day, listening to you as the guest driver analyst on the IndyCar radio network that day. And that right. was the first chance I'd had to listen to you for any length of time because you were still in Indy Lights back then. But I heard what I was hearing back then because I'm an Indiana boy from birth, but I was uh, on this island in Scotland trying to listen to the race on the internet and listening to you and uh, the guys call the race. And I'm thinking, it's a good thing I got out of radio when I did because – He's going to come along and beat some of us some of these days in radio as well. Tell me about when Alex came into the paddock, because he came in a few years after you, and you were already established in IndyCar. And he was coming in from F1. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, Alex is, uh, Alex is you know, a tenure in the series started, I think, in a way that uh, caught him sort of by surprise. And, you know, I'll let him jump in and correct any of my uh, – historical inaccuracies here but you know he had had a a deal to uh to compete in formula one in 2016 originally and that was sort of taken from him and uh and indycar was sort of the the, the stop gap i think uh, initially but uh what was awesome about about you know meeting alex kind of really the first week he was in indianapolis was really seeing the change in him because he did come over sort of feeling like uh, it's weird talking about him like he's not listening, uh, but uh, sort of feeling like, you know, this this was a mildly inconvenient way to spend a year, but he'd be back on track to Formula One in no time. And seeing the transition over a very short period of time to him all of a sudden, like embracing the IndyCar world, the cars, the form of racing, the camaraderie within the paddock. It was awesome to see, you know, we had a, we had another convert, so to speak. And, you know, he's, he's since become one of my best friends in the paddock. And, and I mean, he stood in my wedding. So we've obviously grown pretty close. I can't stand the guy. <laughs> How did you guys get connected with Tim? Um, I don't know. Around. We had this discussion. I still do not understand. I don't know when we met for the first time. I don't know who introduced us or why. I don't know why we still chat. It doesn't make any sense to me. It's kind of like the, uh, the Shining. Like you started hanging out with me and then you realize you've always been here. I've always been here. <laughs> well, the first, the very first time I met Tim, um, like he was kind of just at a, at a test in Phoenix and he was a nice enough guy, and, and he he was someone that kind Before of we did that video, yeah, yeah. He was he was cordial and started talking to me, and, and it was easy to have a conversation with. And it was funny, and it was like, okay, that's fine. And then like we ended up talking for like twenty minutes or so, and then he kind of just left. And I was like, who is this? Like, <laughs> here? like he's not an Andretti Autosport employee, but he's like doing videos for Andretti, and he seems to know everyone. But he's not part of – I just – it was very confusing. And uh, here we are four years later. And I'm podcast. not going to clarify any of that. I'm not going <laughs> to I'm not gonna give any details. Not wrong. <laughs> I don't think you can. I don't think you actually know why you were there or why you were doing videos for Andretti hey, Autosport. We made a fun video that day, though. It was a good video. Yeah. Good video. That was actually a good one. Well, let's this open up a bourbon. No, sorry. What do you say we open up the first bourbon? It's sample A that you guys have. I'm surprised Tim still has his left. <laughs> he was actually just tea. Yeah, I, I drank it all. And, and, and Mark, thank you, uh, thank you kindly for the uh, for the glasses here. These are very uh, very nice, Glen Cairns. Well, that's uh, that's how we roll around here. That's the only way you get these is if you're either in our whiskey club of the month, or you're a panelist on one of our tasting panel shows, or you catch me at a whiskey festival. If I happen to have a couple in my bag, and sometimes I've been known to carry them, it's the only swag we have. And uh, I wasn't sure what you guys had for glassware, so I wanted to make sure you guys had something we could uh, taste and nose properly with. Perfect. So we're going to start out with appreciated a classic, ancient, ancient age, ten year old. 
And I'm going to point out here, I have a smart ass on the uh, comments line. My daughter points out, Brianna says, or are related. Yeah, the family gets I'm sure she has a couple. (laughs) (laughs) She has access to the keys to the warehouse. Back to the whiskey, though. Ancient, ancient age, 10-year-old. Not the 10 star, which is, I think, about six years old now. But the 10-year-old, this hasn't been on the market for probably since 2012, 2013. And when it was on the market, it was Kentucky only. It was made at Buffalo Trace, and it is at uh, 43%, 86 proof. And we went and talked briefly, and I I know Hinch and Tim said they had not tried this. I'm not sure if you've ever tried this before. Alex, have you tried it? I have not, but I'm a big fan of any Buffalo Trace product, so I'm excited. Okay. So uh, you guys know how to do this, so let's get the noses in there and see what you think. And there are no wrong answers here. And if uh, folks have a dram at home, please go ahead and uh, pour something for yourselves as well. I'm going to let these guys. Yeah, you definitely smell the lower proof. And this is more about what you guys know. I'm really picking up much other than the, the alcohol content, to be honest. Any notes of, say, does it smell, say, like uh, maybe caramel or caramel apples or brown sugar or molasses or something like that? You get any of that in there? There's something There's something sweet there for sure. <clears throat> A little bit of the caramel. Hmm. Maybe kind of but it is, Yeah, it's, it, is, it is sweet. It's a hard no for me on, on anything on the nose, which is interesting. <laughs> Now that you mentioned the, the caramel, I can definitely smell that. So I wonder how much of a product that is of, of you mentioning yes. it first. <laughs> caramel or like honey kind of just like it's got a sweetness to it that I don't hate the smell of. <laughs> One of the fun things I noticed uh, when I've come to the IndyCar races in the past was if you're down in the pits, when you guys fire up the engines, when you're using uh, the fuel grade ethanol, which is 85% ethanol, that stuff isn't far off from the ethanol that's used in whiskey. And it smells an awful lot like a distillery around. <laughs> I, I don't think I made that comparison or not, but I, that's I, why I like racing. Must be uh, why we like racing so much. <laughs> <laughs> so I went, I went ahead and tried it because I was struggling to pick up anything with my nose and I got a lot of cinnamon. Okay. Well, go Which, ahead but, and let's see what you get on the taste. Tim? I'm, I'm getting the cinnamon that he's talking about. It's a lot, I guess, the lower alcohol content is a lot smoother than I was expecting. Yeah, I'm getting, I'm getting some kind of leathery, leathery flavors on the back end for sure. Little, little bit of spice, a little bit of leathery, a little bit of leather. Where, where does this rank on? Are the four that you sent me kind of ones that are in your rotation right now? Or are these some of your favorites, or or how did you come up with with these four samples? I came up with these because basically what I did was pick uh, four of the. Uh, Bottles off of my shelf that were extremely hard to find, that haven't been around in a long time, or that were very rare when they did come out. And I figured you guys had access to all the current stuff, so I wanted to give you something to try that uh, to challenge you a little bit and give you a chance to taste something that uh, you might not have tasted before. That's that's awesome. We appreciate all that. you're doing I, is making it diff. You, you, you know, you're going to make us fall in love with something that we can't get our hands on now. That's the problem. <laughs> well. That's not the case. It's just a chance for you guys to taste something and get out of your comfort zone a little bit, but to widen your knowledge a little bit. Um, we joke about this all the time, but the <clears throat> stuff back here is, yeah, it's a library, but it's for sharing. And it's whiskey is best when it's shared with friends. And I personally think that uh, we want to, I want to try to get as many of these whiskeys into friends, into people's hands as I can. So we, that's why I wanted to pick four out of here that, uh, 
I might not ever be able to replace them, but I want to make sure I share them with people who will enjoy them. And I've enjoyed watching you guys over the years and listening to the podcast, and I wanted to share them with you. So can I can I quarantine there? Appreciate um, it. Your your selection's <laughs> a lot better than mine. <laughs> you gonna bring Pappy with you? <laughs> His name yes. is Teddy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes, I'll bring the puppy. <laughs> Very well played, Mark. Very well played. <laughs> well, explain so this. Mark, what, what do you get out of this one? His dog. Yeah, you James, do you want to you want to explain what, what you named your dog after? Right. So I named my dog Weller because Weller's uh, kind of my favorite brand. And when Thim told us that he was getting a puppy, uh, Alex and I immediately threw out names like Russell's or Pappy or, you know, uh, and evidently he let his five-year-old daughter decide the name, which I thought was rude. Uh, Well, here's the other thing about that. I told them that my daughter was going to pick the name. So Alex actually showed up to my daughter's sixth birthday party to suggest Pappy. He like I think that's the only reason he came there was to lobby a six year old like, hey, uh, name name this dog Pappy. And then he, uh, what were Obviously, the other ones you added? Had Alex? A great lobbyist. Um, I didn't just come for that. You had White Castle. <laughs> that's true. Oh. I also had White Castle for my daughter's birthday, okay. so he did yeah. come for that too. And I love your daughter, so it was, it was a win win for all of us. Well. My oldest daughter, the one who chimed in earlier, has a border collie and named Poppy, and I keep referring to her as Poppy Van Winkle. So that's good. That's good. <laughs> so if you want a little bit of water, of this tell me what you think with some water, see if that changes it and opens it up a little bit with just a few drops of room temperature water. I named one of my dogs off of a fictitious um, meal and event that <laughs> Tim and I participate in. So I'm not one to judge on dog names. So while you guys are adding water and nosing this, are you, for the are record, you, Pappy is still a better name. Thing series. Uh, I've been watching the the iRacing IndyCar Challenge and. Uh, Sage Karam keeps beating everybody in the field, but I think it's because he basically sits at home and runs his sim operation all the day, all day long. I mean, Will Power is pretty good too, <laughs> which is annoying. <laughs> I was uh, I was doing a race two nights ago, I think uh, that Sage was in. Oh, it was last night, and uh, it was one that Joseph Newgarden hosted, and he won it. And you know, TK was on the radio and. <laughs> somebody else maybe i forget who else was on there and uh we're like sage you're just too good at this stuff and he was like we, we were kind of giving him a bit of flack about it he was like man you guys got to remember all the last five years when you've been driving real cars i've been doing this i'm like okay when you put it into perspective like that it's a bit different so adding water to this definitely expanded it for me a little bit um and gave it a bit of depth and i'm now getting Almost like a, I don't know if chocolate, dark chocolate is the right word. Yeah. But I'm getting Maybe that like on. Or, huh? Yeah. Like a baker's chocolate or uh, like a like a like one of those heavy high cocoa level chocolate bars. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like a, a bitter dark chocolate. Yeah. yeah. It's Maybe growing on me. With a little bit of water. Which one of these pairs with an eight-hour Netflix binge and, and just general sadness? Yes. <laughs> All of them. <laughs> All of them. But yeah, for me, it's um, it, it softened off that sort of leathery feeling on the back. It's it, it tastes a bit earthy, a bit – I don't know if that's – maybe it's the oak in there. But it's um, – for me, it's got sort of that earthy finish. Um, and it, was, it was softened off definitely a bit by the water. We have a comment from Slim. What are you getting in this one, Mark? Late. What are you drinking? We are drinking ancient, ancient age, 10-year-old bourbon right now. And we have uh, three more that we'll be going with. Glad you're watching right now. So do you guys like this one? I would give this one a a a solid solid five. Like it's middle of the road for me. I'm going to be perfectly honest. Sounds good. I think I'd go go a little higher. Seven range. Okay. Well, let's move on to our second one. This one is limited availability outside of Kentucky, but uh, 
Our old pal, Jim Rutledge, who uh, was the master distiller for almost five decades at Four Roses and retired a couple of years ago, has uh, out with his Cream of Kentucky bourbon and sourced whiskey. It's come from another distillery. Jim didn't say which one it was. I am guessing it was not Four Roses, but uh, it's 11 and a half years old. And Jim has modeled this one at 51% ABV. So uh, let's try this one. It's gotten some rave reviews around Kentucky. You'll find my tasting notes for all four of these bourbons on the Whiskey Cast website as well. But once again, this is about what these guys are tasting and not what I'm tasting. But if you want to look at my tasting notes for reference later on, feel free. So let's go ahead and try the Cream of Kentucky, 11 and a half year old bourbon. Once again, if you have questions or comments, feel free to throw them in in the chat windows, and we will uh, try to pass them along. I get a lot of wood wood in this one and leather. Um, yeah. The nose is much more upfront for me on this than it, than it was the other. Yeah. yeah. It you, almost smells a little scrunchy to me. The wood you're going to have from the, in the bourbons. What was that? The older the whiskey gets, the more influence you're going to have from the wood. Sure. And we're we're going to try a 21-year-old here in a few minutes, and I know you're going to get wood on that one. It, it is it is a little scotchiness to it, James. You're right. <clears throat> yeah, it's, I, I smell that a little bit more on this one, for sure, than, than most bourbons, actually. So one, one thing to note is James knows this, knows this very well, but I absolutely despise Four Roses, except for their anniversary <laughs> bottles. So I'm very <laughs> taste this and see if it changes my impression of at least one of the the creators. <laughs> it's uh, like almost a little bit of vanilla in there. Or am I crazy on that? No, no, the vanilla comes from the uh, vanillins in the oak that the alcohol uh, pulls extracts from the oak during maturation. That's how you get the vanilla notes in there. The vanilla and the caramels come from the caramelized sugar. The vanillins come from the uh, chemical, the compounds in the wood that break down over time with the alcohol. And actually, that's where you get the vanilla. Yeah. So you'll get vanilla in a lot of bourbon, in a lot of bourbons for that reason. Mm -hmm. Has, has right. anyone tried it yet? I'm sorry, Alex, what? Have you tried it yet, James? Not yet. No. Go ahead. Peppery. It's yeah, it is a little spicy, but not in a bad way. I actually quite like that. Yeah, yeah. it's got a lot of rye in the. Uh, it's a yeah, fish bill. That I'm makes uh, sense. that makes sense. Rye guy. Yeah, I'm a I'm a rye guy for sure. Guilty as charged. No, that's um, that's got a lovely flavor. Had you guys had much experience with whiskey before getting into bourbons a few years ago? Zero. No. Like I said, I mean, kind of Basil Hayden's was, I, I, I like that kind of with a rock. And that was all I really knew to order. And I was actually introduced to it by the guy that, that James mentioned earlier, who was um, his previous um, podcast host. We had a, an event together in Las Vegas and uh, he took me out to lunch and he was like, oh, do you like bourbon? I was like, ah, not really. I don't, I don't really know anything about it. And he Kind of opened with with basil Haynes and from that lunch i kind of fell in love with it and now four years later we we drink bourbon pretty much all the time <laughs> together so. very regularly yeah a lot um but yeah no it's 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 uh it's interesting i used to like mckellen a lot until i started to appreciate bourbon and now i can't stand it so it's, it's just the, the evolution of of your taste and i really don't like scotch at all anymore which I don't know. Okay. I've always struggled with scotch. I mean, my, my brother lived in the UK for six years and he uh, developed quite an affinity for scotch. Um, and I'm trying to, I'm sort of, you know, moving him to the bourbon side a little bit, but uh, I've always just, I've always found them a little bit too peaty and a bit, a bit too earthy. And again, I, I probably haven't, you know, dived uh, too far into it to, uh, to get some of the better ones. But for me, kind of Glenn Morangy was sort of the only one I could 
genuinely enjoy a glass of, you know, without just trying to feel like I was, you know, suffering through it, if I'm <laughs> honest. But then discovered bourbon. And, you know, so when I when I started with bourbon, the one that really turned me was so there's a restaurant here in Indianapolis called uh, it's, it's a barbecue joint. It's called North End Barbecue. And they do the they have a very extensive bourbon list and they have um, kind of tastings that you can you can plan. So for my birthday one year, I think we got a group of 10 people went down and did, I think, a five or six bourbon tasting. And the guy came in and he educated us all a lot on on, you know, how bourbon's made, the rules that make it bourbon, whatever. And we tried a, a variety of different bourbons. And I think with a lot of a lot of people, when you're new to it, you kind of default to some of the sweeter stuff. It's a little bit easier to, to kind of get through. And he had uh, in our lineup an Angel's Envy rum finished rye and very sweet, which I mean, today I could have, you know, maybe a finger of it. And that's that's probably all I could do. But back then it was it tasted like candy. I'm like, this is OK. I like bourbon <laughs> now. This, this is this stuff, you know, and uh, it just kind of helped my palate accept, you know, whiskey and accept bourbon and start to develop. And uh, and that was kind of the one that really did it for me. My nope. takeaway from that was that I wasn't invited to that birthday party. Me neither. You know, I didn't know you then. <laughs> I didn't know you either. <laughs> so no Canadian whiskeys for you, James. I know that you're from uh, the Toronto area, right? Yeah, I am. And um, love, uh, I Drake mean, whiskey. I love which? Drake. <laughs> the Virginia Black. Oh, yeah. Virginia Black. I mean, it was actually better than I thought it was going to be, in all honesty. Uh, you know, not not in my top five, but it was better than I thought. Um, you know, obviously, you know, Crown comes out with some good stuff every once in a while. Um, but no, honestly, the, the Canadian whiskeys haven't uh, haven't captured me in a, in a tremendous way um, from the ones that I've tried. Do you have a favorite Canadian whiskey, Mark? I have a, a bunch of them, and I will acknowledge that Lot 40 is one of our sponsors, and by the way, that uh, Virginia Black of Drake's is not actually made in Canada, nor is it made in Virginia. It's made in Indiana, down at <laughs> I-74, down at MGP. No way. Yeah. It's made in <laughs> Indiana. Oh, of course, yeah. But, well, that's, uh, why we, that's why he liked it. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, we have a Canadian and an American, yet the American has Crown Royal sponsorship on his car. A few races. Yeah, it seems... It seems wrong, doesn't it? Although most of those bottles end up at my house anyway, so it's fun. <laughs> well, hey, you're with Andretti for the for this 500, right? So that'll That's be going true. your way too. That's true. Well, we have a mutual friend, Alex, in uh, Stephen Wilson at Crown Royal. Okay. Yep. And I know that, and he sends his regards, by the way. I told him you were coming on the show. Fantastic. I know you've done some stuff with him during May the last couple of years as part of their uh, the Wall of Honor that they do for uh, military veterans around Memorial Day and around the Armed Forces Day holidays. You want to tell us about that for a second? Sure. Um, so, so Crown Royal is um, very supportive of, of you know, our, our, our armed forces, um, our veterans, current and, and former um, people who have served our country. And, and in partnership with the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, uh, last year they launched the Wall of Gratitude, um, which is this amazing kind of – structure. Um, I don't know what the right terminology is, kind of statue. It's, it's a wall. Um, and there's a lot of, of names listed of, of uh, heroes who we're appreciative of. And, and there's so much around the month of May and the Indianapolis 500 that are about our veterans and about those who serve our country and, and make the ultimate sacrifice. And it was very special for me to kind of be one of the spokespersons for the Wall of Gratitude and the unveiling of it. And and just the, the representation of, of kind of Crown Royal's desire to give back and to continue to support um, our current and former active military members and their families. And uh, it's just, it's, it's very cool. It all ties in very well to the Indianapolis 500 and a lot of what that event celebrates. And um, it's more than just driving race cars in a circle. Um, it's about the, the community. It's about the nation. And it's about the history of, of everything that we came from. So what do we think of uh, Cream of Kentucky now that you guys have, guys have had a chance to taste it? I, I like it. I like it more. Than the it's, more it's more complex for me. Um, it's got a bit more going on. So 
I'd give this a good six and a half, seven on a score. Tim, what do you think? I, I like this one a lot more as well. Um, I, I didn't – I would have put the last one at about a seven, so, so I don't know where that lands this. But, um, yeah, I, I like a little bit of the spice that it has. I think the, the flavors are a little more complex. I, I enjoy this one more. I have to admit, I'm, I really enjoy this one a lot. I'm, not, I'm trying to remember what I scored. I think I scored this a 94 on a 100-point scale. But um, I've, I've enjoyed this one. And it's one I, I, I've, I've actually never seen this on a store shelf. I was, they sent me a bottle of it when, I was, uh, when it first came out to be able to do tasting notes on it. So it's hard to find on the East Coast, but you can find it in Kentucky. So let's move on now to our oldest one. Elijah Craig, 21-year-old. All right. I'm excited about this. I'm a <laughs> big Elijah Craig guy. Tim, or sorry, James. James really isn't. Um, but in my top three whiskeys, bourbons ever is the uh, Barrel Proof B517. Um, I found a case of that in New York and scooped it up about a year and a half ago, and I'm down to my last bottle and a half. Um, I love that stuff. So I have I have an 18-year. See um, but I'm really excited to try this. So thank you. I don't, I have a bottle of the 23, but it's almost empty and I didn't have enough of it to send four samples out or send samples to you guys. I, I was thinking about that one, but I've looked at it. And I'm going, there's not enough to get three good samples out of that one. So, but this one I had some of them. If you're a whiskey nut, you'll recognize this is the old labeling. They've since uh, updated the uh, Elijah Craig packaging. I think this is about a six or seven year old bottle that uh, was actually, if you look at it, this was distilled back in 1990. So this was actually, I think, about the time you got from <laughs> Burnaby, even. Or I know before. A little, a little before Alex. <laughs> yeah, a little before Alex. You're the youngest of the bunch. But uh, this was distilled in 1990, which makes it unusual because it's one of the few whiskeys you'll find that was around still from Heaven Hill before the 1996 fire in Bardstown that destroyed the distillery. They now right. put everything up at Bernheim in Louisville. So it's hard to find pre-1996 Heaven Hill whiskey anymore. But this is one of those few single barrels that's still out there. So poor are, they still, are they still producing? Smells like an Elijah Craig. Okay, I'm sorry. Go ahead, please, Alex, one more time. Are they, still, are they still releasing a 21 and 23 every year or no? They release it when they have bought barrels that meet the standard. It's generally an annual release, but they release those, uh, the 1821 and 23s when they have barrels that hold up. Because they don't, since it's based on supply, they don't always have uh, a supply of barrels that hold up generally. But yeah, these are, they try to make this an annual release. Yeah, 23 years is tough to get anything out of it. I'm sorry, what? 23 years is tough to, to, get, to get anything out of a barrel, for sure. Yeah. Uh, at that point, you're down to the point where if it goes much longer than that, you've basically got uh, syrup in the bottom and, and not much else because of all the evaporation over the years. And have you guys had a chance to go into a Rick house down there? Mm. Yes, sir. Yep. What do you yeah, think we actually, when you uh, go to those places? Love it. Love it. I mean, everything about it, the, the design of them, the engineering behind them, it's so simple yet so sophisticated. The smell is incredible. I mean, Alex even bought a Rick House scented candle and put it in his house, and it's amazingly, <laughs> it, it recreates the scent amazingly accurately. Uh, but yeah, no, we uh, we had an opportunity actually with our group to go to uh, go down to Kentucky and do a, do a single barrel select uh, of Blanton's. Uh, that we're going to actually be releasing uh, for charity here. It was supposed to be in May, but obviously with everything going on, it's going to be, you know, deferred a little bit, but uh, incredible, incredible experience. Y yet another thing I wasn't invited to. Correct. Not part of the group. <laughs> we should also point out Tim spends most of his time out in California. He does. I don't think that's why. No, it's not. <laughs> but we're going to go with that. <laughs> Okay, what do you think of the nose on this one, guys? I don't know. I just want to try it. Sorry. Nope. Oh. <laughs> I get a little bit of honey. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's got it's got that sort of distinct EC scent to it. To be honest, I get a little bit of cherry cola. 
Hmm. Like you're drinking like black cherries or like a like a cherry coke or something like that with some vanilla. I could see that. I get something almost um, like like piney. Yeah, like pine Pine almost. Yeah, yeah. Or like a little bit of pipe tobacco, something like that. Where do you come up with cherry cola? That wouldn't even enter my mind as a potential option. Like that's a very (laughs) well. No, it's if you get this. sort of like a, a combination of a caramel cola taste, like if you were drinking a, a Coke or a Pepsi, but then you get that sort of like that little maraschino cherry note, the little tangy. Yeah. Mm. It sort of is like if you've tried a cherry cola, it sort of is that combination that sort of makes it a little more descriptive. Sure. Oh, I love it. Yeah. Actually, I, you're not wrong. Now, I, Yeah, now I can't get anything else. <laughs> well, if you want to add a little bit of water to this one, go ahead. Or if you want to just drink it and eat, what the hell, go for it. What's the proof on this one? 45% ABV, 90 proof. Let's bring in some more comments now um, from J.D. Hook, adding both of those to my list. Thanks, gents. Uh, we are getting recommendations about Irish whiskeys now. J.D. Hook, open on recommendations on other Irish to try from Dave Kuhn. Yellow Spot is amazing. Yes, it is. Graham Frazier. Um, John's Lane, Powers John's Lane, cask strength, single pot still is a stunner. Yes, that is. Um, and then from JB, I think Crown Royal is American owned now. I think Canadian Club is still Canadian owned. Let's correct that. Crown Royal is internationally owned because it's owned by Diageo, which is based in England. Canadian Club is owned by Beam Suntory, which is based in Japan. <laughs> okay. And Chicago. So there. There you go. But uh, they're still both made in Canada. Grand Royal is made at the uh, distillery that Diageo owns in Gimli, Manitoba, up in the middle of the uh, rain belt up there. And it is a beautiful place, Um, a bit flat, a bit desolate, but a lot of grain. A great place to visit in the summertime. And Crown Royal, I'm sorry, rather, the Canadian Club Whiskey is made at the Hiram Walker Distillery in Windsor, Ontario, uh, technically, it's made by uh, Pernod Ricard under contract for Canadian Club. Uh, th- there's a whole long story you go back there that goes back 15 years to various mergers and demergers and uh, corporate breakups. And uh, as Bill Ricker points out, Irish whiskey can be a gateway from bourbon to scotch or vice versa. Tim Trego, the pain train is watching from Pennsylvania, and we're pouring our own now. Hello, guys. Uh, I love the paint tour, guys. Yeah, they're great. <laughs> and Graham Fraser, Buffalo Trace or Woodford Reserve would be the ideal first bourbon I'd recommend to a newbie. Yeah, that's okay. fair. I mean, BT for an off-the-shelf, you know, easy to drink, low dollar. I mean, it's it's hard to beat that one. Some of the barrel selects you get out of those from some of the liquor stores around town here and, and down there are just incredible. It's getting hard to find now, though. Like, it's not as prevalent, honestly. It's mm. pretty crazy. So this this twenty one year, um, it's the the flavor develops more as it after you kind of finish it, and on the back of your tongue and your throat, it it kind of stays with you, which is pretty cool. Yeah, very complex, and yeah. a lot of twenty one year old bourbons when you find them are really just like uh, oak monsters. It's over oaked and. Uh, I know Jimmy Russell at Wild Turkey has always said for years he would never bottle anything over 15 years old. Right. Because he considers it over-oaked. And then when his son Eddie took over as co-master distiller, Eddie started bottling 17-year-old stuff just to make Jimmy mad. <laughs> it's relatively low proof. So do you think they're getting away with, with hiding some of the oak from it just because of how diluted it is? I'm sorry. What was that again? I couldn't quite understand. So it's relatively low proof. So do you think they're getting away with hiding that kind of over oakedness just because they've diluted it so much? No, I think what they're trying to do is because it's a single barrel, they want to make sure that uh, they have enough to stretch and get a little bit out of that. But the 45% is actually a pretty good number. It's right at that limit where 45, 46% where you don't have to chill filter it, where you don't have to add coloring into it to keep a nice dark color. And I don't believe they do anyway. But at 45%, they're not adding that much more water into it than they would get out of those single barrels. Because after 21 years, you're not you're going to be in the low 50s anyway, just because of evaporation. Hmm. 
So mm -hmm. I think we're doing it just to provide a consistent taste while still remaining, because single barrels are going to vary, vary obviously from barrel to barrel. So they're trying to keep it consistent and reducing it to 45 lets a few more people maybe get, it, get their hands on it who might not otherwise. Right. Interesting. So just, if, uh, if you added probably, water, what did you get? I say I just put that in, so I'm going to try that now. I haven't done water I like yet. I got, yeah, I added a bit. I feel like it got less complex. It kind of went the other way. But that also could be because we're on tasting three. Yeah. Or too much water. Or too much water. I'll add some more bourbon back to it. That's always good. <laughs> you know, with water, you only need a few drops, uh, like a bottle. Yeah. Like, even just like if you're bottled water, like a bottle cap full is enough in a glass. Like yeah, that's about as much as I added. That's why I like the straw trick. Mm -hmm. That's a good way to do it. Yep. I have eye droppers that I use just to get a few drops in, but uh, straw works perfectly at, if you're at a bar, mm -hmm. you guys drink fancier than me. <laughs> you drink, you drink rum and vodka, Tim and Jameson. Not, not together. Sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that one birthday party. <laughs> We're putting your comment on the bottom of the screen uh, from whiskey. Jason. Hi guys. Uh, John Lane asking how it compares to the 23. I got my tasting notes at the website for both of them. I'm not, I'm not going to pull the 23 down and do a side by side here. Um, but you can check the website for my comments on the 23. Um, Graham Fraser, anyone tried the Jameson's Black Barrel? I've not, but it's had great reviews. Uh, yeah, Black Barrel's pretty good. Um, it's done in a little more heavily charred casks, and uh, I enjoyed that one. Graham Fraser points out the cost of barrel strength bourbons in, in the UK has increased dramatically. Yes, it has, and you can blame the trade wars for that one. Because the European Union, about a year and a half, almost two years ago now, slapped a 25% tariff on American whiskeys as part of its uh, trade disputes with uh, the U.S. And yes, that has forced, forced the cost of your bourbons to go up, and I'm sorry about that. Nothing I can do about it. <laughs> We've complained about that for a long time. So what do you think with water, James? It's, you know what, it actually didn't, I don't know if I didn't put enough in, but it, it didn't change it a whole lot for me. It's sort of a, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> as Alex said, East has not traditionally been uh, my favorite. I actually prefer the, the C919 over the, uh, the B517, even though it was, you know, bourbon of the year. And it's, uh, it's, it's still got a fair amount of spice. I do get some of that. I do get a lot of that oakiness still. And it's it's almost like it's got um, yeah, it's still got a lot of a lot of heat on the back end for me, you know. When you kind of you get through some of the spices, which I like, and then it just sort of keeps going and still kind of builds on the palate, rather than sort of taper off and smooth on the finish for me. Okay. Um, any final thoughts on this one, Alex, before we move on? Um, I, I like it with water and that's, that's rare for me, honestly. Like I am usually a guy that, that drinks it neat and prefers it neat, um, across all, all ranges of proofs. But I think with water that, that opens it up really nicely and, it's, it's interesting. We're coming, the progression is steadily going upwards for me. So I started at five, now went to a six and a half, and I'd say this is a, a seven and a half out of 10 for me. So can't wait for uh, round four. <laughs> <laughs> well, before we go on to the last bourbon, James, I want to give you a chance to talk about a cause that I know that is close to your heart, uh, donating blood. Because yes. I was uh, at a local blood drive yesterday. And waited several weeks for it. And I will acknowledge, and I shouldn't say it openly because I'm going to catch hell from my daughters for this. I got rejected for the first time ever because my blood pressure was a little bit off, a little bit higher than they wanted. Ah, But I know how important it is to you. And I want to give you a chance to talk about this because uh, with this virus and the pandemic that's going around, a lot of the blood banks around the whole world are running into crisis and really in need right now. And uh, I know how close this is to your heart. So I want to give you a chance to talk about this one. 
Yeah, Mark, I appreciate that. First of all, I appreciate you going out to donate and, and sounds like you're a regular donor and, and that's uh, that's massively appreciated, but you absolutely nailed it. Um, the pandemic globally has canceled uh, a lot of drives uh, around the world. If you think about where a majority of, of blood drives are held, <clears throat> excuse me, it's at big businesses and, and at schools, you know, universities and colleges and things like that. Obviously, all of that shut down. And so the need for blood globally has not declined. If anything, it's on the increase with the stress on the healthcare system. But the the ability to actually collect blood has uh, has waned significantly. So whatever area you're in and what I love about this is, you know, we've got uh, people watching from from all over the world. Uh, whatever the organization is that does, you know, blood collection in your area, get on their website and look. I know a lot of these places are doing sort of pop up smaller drives every couple days throughout a week to make sure they can try and keep the supply going as best they can. It's massively important, and not just because of what's happening with COVID nineteen. You got to think of all the existing pre existing reasons for people needing blood trauma surgeries, chemo patients, burn victims. All these people uh, regularly need blood. And, uh, and unfortunately, while the rest of the world has shut down, accidents still happen and, and people still get sick. So this is still a, a very important need. So if you, have the, if you have the chance, look it up. Most people have a little bit more time on their hands than they, than they have <laughs> recently and they do normally. And I know the economy is making it tough for people to want to donate financially, which is obviously also a good help. This costs you absolutely nothing. So you've got the time. It costs you nothing and it does save lives. So yeah, blood donation, absolutely needed worldwide. And, uh, and definitely cause it's close to me. And, and you get a cookie. I'm sorry, go ahead. And you get a cookie or a, or a bag of chips <laughs> or a lollipop. <laughs> Sometimes I went to one that was pizza. It was great. Yeah, and look you get, why it's close to you, James. I mean, your life is, you're still here because of blood donations. Absolutely. That's no doubt. When I had my accident in 2015, I had 22 units of blood pumped through my body. Uh, my body only holds 11. So I had two full oil changes is the joke that I like to make. And if that supply hadn't been on hand, you know, I, I wouldn't be sitting here today. So it's what, what I was frustrated with immediately after my accident was how ignorant I was of the need for blood and of the, the real situation, you know, about blood donation and blood collection. And I sort of made it my goal at that point to just be an advocate for it, just try to educate people more than anything on the need for blood and, and how important it is. And we cannot have too much of it because the demand is always outweighing supply. And we have a comment from a, a guy I know that you know in uh, Ontario, <laughs> Jeff Pepone, member of the Canadian Motorsports <laughs> Hall of Fame. Is Hinch saying that regular bourbon drinkers can still give blood? You know what? What's funny is we hosted a blood drive uh, during the month of May in Indianapolis, which of course is when the Indy 500 runs. And I was under the impression, again, in my earlier days of this, this is the, the, the year after my accident, that if you were drunk, you shouldn't give blood. You couldn't give blood. <laughs> um, I've, su I've subsequently learned through my time with uh, the Red Cross here in the States that that's actually not true. They can separate the alcohol and drunk blood is just as good as sober blood. So even if you're a little tipsy, it's totally fine. You can still go in. You can still donate. <laughs> you're still saving lives. Well, and you got to think about it this way. There are two ways to rise your blood alcohol content. <laughs> Add alcohol or subtract blood. <laughs> and one of them is way cheaper. Yeah. <laughs> and you get a cookie. And you, get, and a you get a cookie. So here's the thing. I have not been to one of James's blood drives, um, but now I have two reasons to go. The cookie <laughs> can't. What? I don't think you're allowed. Why? Didn't you live in England at some point? Yes. Yeah, yeah I don't think Mad Cow well, lets you I donate. It was like between like 1990 and like 1998, back when there was Mad Cow. Oh, okay. All right. You're fine. Because I saw the thing on that yesterday going. <laughs> right. Of course. UK. Yes, but not during those periods of time. Right. I, I give, I donate uh, plasma pretty regularly. And I, I went this year to go do it because, again, it's the same thing. They have the demand and plasma shelf life is like six days. And I found out I'm, I'm ineligible because I had a bone graft for a dental operation. And I was like, that doesn't count. That was my mouth. But no, yeah, that still counts. Connected actually to the rest of your body. Yeah, it turns you know, out. Which is turns little, out. So I'm, little science yeah, I'm thing, not but... eligible until January of next year, unfortunately. 
Well, I uh, I donated a few weeks ago, and according to my blood donor app, I'm good to go again in 14 days. So in two weeks, I'll go again. Assuming you can go. Which, again, there, like I said, there's these little drives are popping up all over the place. So I, I, I know there's going to be a place to do it. I, I know the appointment I scheduled yesterday. It took me – I had to schedule it four weeks out. Because, wow. Because the Red Cross Center here – less than two miles from the house didn't have anything open until yet. That's amazing. That's actually great news. Well, I think it's because they were cutting back on the appointments they had available for social distancing. For sure. So they were making sure they were cutting back on the number of, of opportunities you could do- donate blood. Mm-hmm. So let's go on to our final one. This is the outlier of the bunch in that it is not a Kentucky whiskey. It is from Wyoming. But it has a Canadian angle to it. It's from Wyoming Whiskey. It's one of their private stock single barrels that was bottled for the British Columbia uh, state provincial liquor system and the liquor stores in BC. Ah. Okay. And it is at 54.5% ABV or 109 proof. Beautiful. And there's just a little bit of this one left. So... Once again, it's one of these ones where I wanted to share it with people who I thought would get a kick out of something <laughs> unusual. And I thought you guys would enjoy this. So I'm going to pour We're going to kill the rest of this bottle off. Absolutely. What's the age on it? This is probably about six years old. They've oh, only yeah. been bottling since they started distilling in, I think, 2006 or 2008, rather. 2008, their first bottling was December 1st, 2012. And they've ramped up over the years to where their, their regular barrels are now about close to five, four and a half to five years old. And their single barrels are anywhere between four and six, depending on taste. But they, uh, this is a weeded bourbon as opposed to the rye based ones you've had before. This is more like a Maker's Mark or a Weller in that uh, their original master distiller was Steve Nally, who was the master distiller and Kentucky Bourbon Hall of Fame distiller at Maker's Mark for years. He moved out to Wyoming for a few years with his wife after retirement and distilled for these guys for a while and is back in Kentucky now working at Bargetown Bourbon Company. But this was one of his barrels from back then. And it says on here it was bottled for beautiful British Columbia. British Columbia is beautiful. I will. I will agree with that. <laughs> I was Wyoming. I go it's out every year to the a whiskey festival in BC, and I think it's a law out there that you can't say British Columbia without saying beautiful in front of it. <laughs> <laughs> That's why people just refer to it as BC. It, it takes the beautiful out of it, so it saves time. So this is the strongest one of the bunch, and it's a single barrel once again. So it's a very unique scent. That's a that's a nose that I. I've never it, smelled before. It's made wow. with winter wheat instead of rye as the flavoring grain. So that's why it's going to be different. And it's going to be somewhere in that neighborhood of, uh, say, the Weller that you like. And uh, uh, I'm trying to think what else. It would be <clears throat> in the neighborhood of, say, like a Pappy or a Larceny or an Old yeah. Fitzgerald made with wheat. Right. I mean, the wheat of bourbons I'm a huge fan of. But even still, this is a uh, it's a very unique smell. A lot of there's a like initially it was it was hot so like almost campfirey but now it's it's almost vanilla as it sat in the glass for a little longer. One of the advantages they have up there is they're distilling at altitude, at about seven thousand feet above sea level. So that has some influence in terms of we're still trying to figure that out in terms of. Uh, what the influence is of altitude in terms of uh, the, way it, uh, the way the whiskey moves into and out of the barrels. But they also have these extreme temperature swings up there that are even more than Kentucky, where they'll get down to 20 below in the winter, winter time and 100 degrees in the summertime, Fahrenheit. So right. a lot of extractive and extraction from the wood, but also the wood takes a lot out in terms of subtractive content and what it pulls out of the whiskey. So that's where you get uh, some of the more unique flavor and more unique aroma to it. It's like a spicy molasses, if that makes sense. Yeah. Like there's sweetness, but there's heat with it. Oh, 
That's good. Like hey, that speaking of weeded or wheat whiskey, my favorite non-scotch whiskey yep. ever is <clears throat> the Parker's Heritage 13-year-old wheat whiskey. Put that into a chilled glass, and it's blissful. Greg in Paris, uh, well, it's true. Insane now in Europe, especially in France. Once again, blame the tariffs. Greg also says, I cannot wait to try, oops, I cannot wait to try Shelter Point someday. Shelter Point is a single malt from uh, the Shelter Point distillery in BC on Vancouver Island. Ah, cool. It's a very nice one. I like this a lot. This is, yeah. a, this is a nice one. It's Go ahead and find it, guys, if you haven't already. There's the dog, by the way. There's Pappy. Pappy. Teddy. Come here. Nope. His name is Pappy. <laughs> that's definitely got some... That's got a peppery, sort of spicy finish to it as well. Where do we where do we land on giving dogs bourbon? Is that okay? Not great. I have given my cats bourbon. Uh, we used to have one of my cats uh, that we used to have around the house. Mimi would get up on my desk and knock gla- bottles over, or knock sample bottles over, but she would stick her nose in the glass all the way. <laughs> <laughs> in there for a second, away, I used to refer to it as Mimi approved. And she lived to the ripe old age of 16, so... But, so, yeah, I wouldn't exactly give them... Uh, I wouldn't put it in the dish... <laughs> no, this is this is for me. Yes. We have an explanation from whoops from David Hallett. Because the air is so thin at high altitudes, liquids boil at lower temperatures. Right. High altitude allows distillation temperatures to be lower, which in turn makes it more possible to separate the good from the bad. That's interesting. interesting. Yeah, I'm not sure you don't really do much uh separating of heads and tails in a column still at altitude, but yeah, I could see that. There's some arg- there's some good argument to that, yeah. Um, and you guys like Weller, so Graham Fraser <clears throat> can't get Weller's currently in the UK. Frustrated Pappy drinkers acquiring it all. Yeah, <laughs> I can see that. That happens in a lot of places. So go ahead and taste this one if you haven't already. Greg points out in Paris again. Well, our prices insaneness has nothing to do with international taxes, but rather some French importers agreed to sell it at 15 times more than last year. Yeah, I could see that. You see that place here, too. I know. I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's crazy probably. Me, but... Yeah, it's probably a little bit above. Charles Epperson just poured a dram of Wyoming whiskey single barrel. Love it. Uh so what do you think of the taste, guys? What are you getting on that? And if you want to go ahead and add some water, go ahead. I'm not going to add water to this. Yeah, I'm going to try with water as well. Okay, don't. I, I added a couple drops. I, I like it too much. I, I uh, This is a lot of what I look for. So I don't know that I can quantify it more than that, but I enjoy drinking it. And I'm glad that this was part of one of the bigger sample bottles you gave us. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> Cheers. So how how <laughs> how much are you guys looking forward to doing the five hundred in August theoretically now, with the aero screens and the lack of ventilation? I at this point, I think we're just excited to do the Indy five hundred regardless. I, it could be it could be in a <clears throat> go racing in a sweatsuit, <laughs> a heater in the car, and I'd still be excited about it. So. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it, it's interesting. I think all of our our kind of development and understanding of it is is kind of halted, obviously, but it's the same for everyone. So um, the schedule as it is is, is fairly condensed. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's going to place even more importance on on the teams and drivers that can figure out the the effects of the aero screen out the quickest are going to are going to be looking better as, as the season goes on. But um yeah, I mean, at, at this point, I think we're just excited to go racing, and the countdown is on till August. James, your thoughts? I know you haven't had a chance to really get into the aero screen yet in testing, have you? No, I haven't. But obviously, I've been, you know, kind of uh, speaking to everybody that uh, that's had the chance to drive it, and 
picking Alex's brain a lot and, and my other teammates' brains a lot about, you know, what to expect going into it. And uh, I think the team's doing a great job trying to stay in front of whatever setup changes might come along with it, um, which seem to actually be not a ton. But, you know, especially as we get to the super speedways and things like that, there's going to be effects and, and there's going to be places to to find an advantage. And so hopefully, you know, we're on the, the leading edge of that. So any final thoughts on this one? I just have a final thought, not related to bourbon. I love that when James's image pops up and it's big, um, one of the things was that he finished second on Dancing with the Stars. I just like to remind yeah, him. I laughed at that too. That he, <laughs> he couldn't win and that he was America's second favorite dancer. Oh, I'm, yeah, so. yeah. I was <laughs> screwed on Dancing with the Stars, James. Oh, well, thank you, sir. I appreciate it. <laughs> because they didn't no, let, look. He just he couldn't compete against a sixteen-year-old girl, and yeah. that's something that he has to accept and live with. I mean, that's normal for other things in life. In a dancing competition, <laughs> that makes perfect sense. Your natural audience didn't get to vote for you. That's true. You know, I, I, in a show that normally allows Canadian voters, that was one of the few seasons they did not. I think it was I only mean, two seasons they didn't. To be honest, I I voted for her. I was going to say, That's I voted fair. for Lori Hernandez, too. Yeah. She was a phenomenal dancer. She was a phenomenal dancer. <laughs> and we didn't get a chance to really point it out, but uh, Alex, you did the amazing race or the great race with uh, the amazing race with Connor Daly a couple of years ago. Yes. See, where James, I feel like. Inch finished in Dancing with the Stars. Yeah, here's the difference. Yeah, Alex, tell us the difference. James had it worse than you. James had a teammate that elevated him. <laughs> Full stop. Unrelated. How's Connor doing? <laughs> Still got diabetes. Mm. I, I got to admit, I was watching the Red Bull video that uh, Alex, you, and Travis Pastrana did with the at the Speedway over the winter, and I, I loved and I. I don't know who the motocross rider was, but when Connor was on the tee at the uh, Brickyard Crossing Golf Course, getting the snow splashed in his face, just like uh, getting his uh, face washed in a hockey stop, that was brilliant. <laughs> that whole video was so good. So, so Connor's ultimate goal in life has always been to be in an energy drink video, whether that's Red Bull, Monster, Rockstar, or whatever. <laughs> Big fan of it. So when we were there and doing the planning for – for the shots that we wanted to get, they were like, oh, you know, we need some golfers and we need some people who are interested um, to kind of be extras. And I was like, I've got the perfect guy. So I reached out to him. <laughs> I had been like 20 degrees. He showed up and stood out in the cold and uh, did a couple of takes um, to pretend he was teeing off with uh, another buddy of ours. And he was a big, a big trooper for that. But yeah, we got him, we got him in an energy drink video. So that was a, a win for all of us, I think. <laughs> Is Connor into bourbons at all? Connor loves bourbon. Yep. He's a he's a big four rose. We're getting him there. We're getting there. We will have to get him on one of these. And uh, we also want to say happy birthday to your teammate, uh, quasi-teammate Jack Harvey, whose birthday is today. Uh, I know that he is a bourbon lover. He follows us on Twitter. And if he's watching, happy birthday. Cheers, Jack. Not, refill for that. that. Yeah. Happy birthday, Jack. So, Alex, that's forgivable. You have 38 teammates. I want to do uh, tastings. Guys, this has been fun. I hope you've had as much fun as I have. Once again, thanks to our panelists, James Hinchcliffe, Alexander Rossi, and especially Tim Durham. You see, Tim was responsible for handling all of the scheduling and logistics at their end to make it all possible. If you're into motorsports, look for their Off Track with Hinch and Rossi podcast wherever you get your podcasts. I'd also like to thank the sponsors of Whiskey Cast, who make it possible for us to bring you these special episodes along with our weekly podcast. Of course, they're Johnny Walker, Redbreast, Mortlock, and the Diageo Classic Malts Range, Heaven Hill Distillery, Lot 40, Sagamore Spirit, and Catoctin Creek Distillery. If you have comments or suggestions for us, we'd love to hear from you. You can find us on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram at WhiskeyCast. The email address is comments at WhiskeyCast.com. WhiskeyCast is a production of Cask Strength Media, 
Copyright 2020. And comes to you from the charming, yet regrettably dry town of Haddonfield, New Jersey. I'm Mark Gillespie, reminding you that when you drink, please drink responsibly. Thanks for listening.